Hello everyone and welcome to this first tutorial of Transform 2021. Very excited to have you all here and we are super pleased to have Pai Gimli giving a tutorial here at Transform 2021. Pai Gimli started in the early 2000s during the PhD project of Carson and Thomas and some 10 years ago Florian joined the project and just 10, year, 10 days ago, Andrea joined the project as well. And we are very excited to have all four of them here giving you a tutorial about how to use PyGimli and get out the most of it. Make sure if you follow live on YouTube, make sure to join the Slack channel on Swang. You will get their support from all four of them if you have troubles installing it or following it along. Um, what else is there to say? Nothing. Florian will start the show and he will lead you through the tutorial. Enjoy. Thank you very much. We are very happy to be here. Um, we want to start by thanking the organizers, so Matt Hall and his colleagues, for putting this wonderful community together, and in particular to Dieter Wertmüller, who onboarded us and went through the technical trial with us, which was already live streamed accidentally. Um, but now this is the real thing. We want to talk about geophysical modeling and inversion. And we will we'll do this in a hands-on manner with PyGimli, a software package that has been developed for yeah, two decades now. And while Thomas and I will be presenting today, Carsten Rücker is really the backbone of this project um, and has written most of the code. And we are very happy to have Andrea Balza just joining us recently. Her fresh perspective was really tremendously helpful in the preparation for today. And uh, we are very much looking to her future contributions. And there are many others, um, Maximilian Weigand from the University of Bonn, who contributed a lot to the induced polarization path, complex valued inversion um, in the last time. And um, Nico Skippe and Friedrich Dinsel, you know who you are. So um, warm welcome. Uh, thank you to all the other contributors. A warm welcome to everyone who's watching live and who will be watching this in the future. Um, you can find all the material uh, under this link, transform21.pygimli.org, and uh, Thomas will show this page in just a second. Um, so what is PyGimli? It's generally an open source, flexible modeling and inversion library for geophysical problems. And it comes with structured and unstructured meshes in two and three dimensions and with the management of these mesh methods meshes. Uh, the computationally more um, expensive part is written in C++, and then we have boost Python bindings to the complete C++ library, and this makes it very flexible, but at the same time, uh, very runtime efficient. There are various ready-made geophysical forward operators, some of which you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, um, for different geophysical problems, and it comes with a general Gauss-Newton type inversion. Um, so this is a deterministic inversion framework, and it has very flexible means of combining different data sets, so um, in the frame of joint or constraint inversions. And um, it has a region-specific regularization, meaning that you can, if you have prior information, you can define different starting and um, um, regularization options for the different subsurface regions. It's open source, platform compatible, and we also use it a lot for teaching and um, reproducible research. Um, and the 1.0 version was published in um, 2017 in Computers and Geosciences and has been picked up quite nicely by the community. Um, a little bit on the software architecture, because the software architecture also builds up our outline today. So we built up on a, uh, a, number, on a number of very powerful dependencies for visualization. We use VTK, matplotlib, PyVista recently, uh, mesh generation, triangle in 2D, and Tetkin in 3D. But we also have interfaces to Gmesh, and in, in particular, Mesh IO, where you can basically um, load in any mesh from outside, and then hopefully also the subsurface integration in the near future. Um, and on top of that, we have PyGimli. Um, and the very basic level would be the equation level. And Thomas will start with that later, where you can basically solve a partial differential equation um, on a user-defined geometry. Um, on top of that, we have the modeling level. So, so this now already includes the physics for the given um, geophysical problems, different types of forward operators. Um, 
And on top of that, we have the so-called application level. And this upper high level is probably the entry point for most users. So if you have a data set, you want to load it, you want to pre-process it, you want to invert it and visualize both results and data misfits, so what we will also do later. Um, this is the way to start. And these three different levels will also be um, discussed today, starting with the mesh generation and the equation level. So this will be our outline for today, um, starting to build a subsurface model, solving a partial differential equation on that very model, moving to the modeling level, so taking the same geometry, but then solving a geophysical problem, in this case, um, cross-hole travel time measurements. And then we will have a 10-minute break and we will um, continue with the inversion side of things. So the first half focuses on modeling, and then we continue with inversion, um, introducing both two geophysical managers, the travel time manager and the ERT manager, applied to synthetic and um, field data. And then in the end, we will explore a bit more what is possible, how to move forward from here, and also demonstrate the integration with other packages so to build your own custom-made inversion. And um, yeah, with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Thomas. Yeah, good morning. A warm welcome also from my side. Can you hear me? And, and can you see my screen? Yeah. OK, uh, the main entry point for PyGimli is the website, pygimli.org, where you can uh, look up uh, several things. You can look up tutorial examples. We go into details about that later on. Uh, main source of information will be the AP documentation, where you find all the different models that we are going to use uh, in this tutorial. And now we come back to the, to the transform tutorial, and we straight go to the uh, transform page. It's a GitHub page where you can all where you can find all the Git, uh, all the Jupyter notebooks that we're going to use today. Uh, you can Git check out from here. You can download the the the, the notebooks by yourself, and you can uh, start. There's also installation instruct. Uh, there's also installation uh, uh, instructions, and uh, uh, but we are not going to do this installation right now. You can do that and. And in case of question, you can uh, direct yourself to the Slack channel, and and people will have you to to do that. So that's the table of contents, and and there's some some installation stuff. And I just want to quickly dive into. So assume you are having uh, your your conda installation ready, everything is prepared. So I'm just starting from the I'm a Windows user. I'm just starting from the starting menu, and then I kind of a PowerShell prompt, and uh, this is located somewhere here. And what I have to do is to uh, is to activate the the transform. So, so I'm typing conda activate pg minus uh, transform, and now I'm in the environment that should have everything that you need today for this course. And uh, and if you if you're not going to work with this environment, I usually go to the to the explorer where I have checked out it. I'm copying the path going here. Into the uh, into the controller, changing directory to this path, and then calling Jupyter uh, Jupyter Lab, and then I'm ending up uh, I like you, and this is and this is what you all can do, and we will do everything from the scratch. So we will start creating a new notebook and typing uh, and typing things like a a equals one, and then and then it will be automatically uh, run. So that's the point. And now Florian will start with the first notebook on creating meshes. Yes, very happy to do so. Um, so I'm in a clean notebook here. Um, I, I copied the one that was um, distributed, but there's not much copied except the heading and the objectives of this notebook. So in this notebook, we want to talk about how to create a subsurface geometry and a mesh. And we will also talk about the differences. But first, uh, discretizing the subsurface is always a very important and first step. We need to define parameters, and we also want to discretize model parameters for the inversion, maybe also dependent on the resolution of our geophysical method. 
Um, and we will talk about geometries and meshes and explore the PyGimli mesh tools. Also, the link to the documentation is provided here. Um, we won't cover all of this, but um, hopefully give you an idea on how to build your model from scratch. Then we will talk about unstructured um, meshes, predominantly in 2D, but we also have 3D capabilities. And um, I will also demonstrate that the transition from 2D to 3D is relatively straightforward. And um, yeah, and finally, we will demonstrate the possibilities to modify, visualize, export, and import different meshes. OK, so ready to start. And we always start with the very first line, which is importing PyGimli SPG. This is our um, shortcut. And um, today, we will be using the mesh tools a lot. So I will also import the PyGimli mesh tools. Um, as a separate module and give it the shortcut MT. This just saves us some typing throughout the run. Um, and then we will start by creating a subsurface model, a geometry. Um, and the very first part is we define some, some values. So let's say we have the left corner of the model, which is at 30 uh, minus. 30 meters, the right corner at um, 30 meters or so 60 meters in total length. And then we also have a depth of 25 meters. So these are just Python integers or floating point values, uh, of course, are also possible um, and make more sense here. And then I use this information um, in a kind of a hello world. Uh, so create world uh, is the function where we start with a lot, um, which creates the geometry and also comes with some um, information on boundary conditions, for example. We, so we can define the lower left and the upper right corner of the geometry. So the um, or the upper left and the lower right is also possible. So I will use the left and the surface at um, y equal to 0. I also have to define an the end keyword argument, and just in case you never worked in a notebook before, what is really handy is if you have a, a function that you will be using. Um, so create world. Uh, ah, I did a small typo here, sorry. So this is the function, and if you do shift tab within the brackets here, you will see the function signatures. So what type of arguments um, do we need to provide to the function? And the ones without the default arguments, so without equal to something, these are the ones um, which have to be specified. So they are non-optional, um, and this is start and end. And then there are many others we can define. And um, so start and end are mandatory, and then we will have a look at the others. And we define the depth here in the um, so negative uh, y values. OK. And important is then to give this thing a name, because we want to reuse it later. And we have a um, very high level generalized show function, which can visualize many different objects. And we will use that pg show function to visualize the world. Um, and it will return the matplotlib axis, and which we can just uh, mute here. So this would just be our rectangle, which we start uh, filling with more um, more interesting objects now. So one thing that we could do is we could provide uh, horizontal layers um, as a list of, of depth levels. So I could put a layer here at um, five meters depth. Um, if you type mesh tools and then create and uh, press tab completion, you will see many different um, functions to define geometrical objects, um, in particular in, in 2D, but also a lot in 3D. And again, we have um, a lot of um, import and export functionality for other more sophisticated 3D mesh generators. And now what I will do here is um, create a line. Um, 
with create line, I also provide start and end of this line. Um, and I can also show it just like I showed the world before. And the nice thing is now that I can add geometrical entries. So I can say that my overall geometry, which I want to use later, should consist both of the world and the line that I just created. And again, I'm using PG show to create and uh, to visualize this geometry. And note that it um, automatically makes a third region because we added this line and this now intersects this uh, lower layer. Um, and we have defined the region markers on top, so layer one and layer two at the bottom. We haven't defined anything particular for the middle layer, so this has the region marker zero. Um, but in the end, these are just numbers which we use to populate the mesh later with physical properties. Um, and we will show you how to do this in the, uh, the following notebooks. Um, okay, so let's make this a little bit more interesting. I think a very flexible function in, um, for creating mesh geometry is create polygon, where you can basically specify um, a number of points which are then connected and uh, optionally closed into any arbitrary shaped objects. And here I'm just using um, three points. So a triangle basically. And I'm calling this a geological body. Some anomaly of geophysical properties in the subsurface for our synthetics here. Okay, so if I visualize this, it has three points. Um, and these could be topography points, for example, could be an interface within the subsurface. But if I really want this as a triangle, I'm, I have to specify that the geometry should be closed. So then it's a closed triangle and it also gets a region number which I can specify. And since I already used everything from one, uh, zero, one, and two, I will give this the region number three. Um, I can also um, add more nodes along the edges, for example, like this. Um, and then I have to make sure that they are also visualized. So with the PG show, we could take an argument of show nodes and we set this to true. So it also shows the, shows the intermediate, uh, all the nodes that the, this geometry has. So I can play around with this. Um, now I will stick with five. And then to make this a little bit more uh, smooth, a little bit more interesting, we can also add an interpolation to this. And I will use the spline interpolation here. So this will smooth these um, objects, should smooth this op these objects. Um, oh, it's interpolate, sorry. It's not interpolation, but interpolate. Um, again, you can check the keyword arguments by pressing shift tab and there tells me interpolate is the keyword argument and linear is its default value, but I'm using spline interpolation here. And this gives me this object, which I can then also add to my geometry. So I can uh, do something like this, adding the body to the geometry and showing the resulting geometry in the end again. Okay, and this will be our geometry that we will be working with um, throughout the rest of this tutorial. Um, but this is just a geometry. It's so basically it's a geometrical definition of boundaries of regions, but it's not a mesh yet. Um, what may be um, a bit confusing in the beginning, but uh, is that we treat everything uh, internally the same. So if we print the geometry, it tells us it is a Pygimli mesh object, but it doesn't contain any cells. So it's just a geometrical definition of all the boundaries and regions and the nodes. Um, but it's not a mesh yet that we can use for finite element simulations or parameter estimations. And how do we get from the geometrical definition to the mesh will be then the next step that we uh, discuss here. Maybe another thing that I 
should note because you saw that it already contains a lot of boundaries and you see the region markers here. Um, the geometry also contains boundary markers. So I can visualize them by boundary markers equal to true. And this will visualize the marker numbers and very much as we can specify physical properties to subsurface region, so to region markers, we can specify initial conditions, so directly or other type of boundary conditions to these boundary numbers and Thomas will demonstrate this later on. Um, before we um, before we can simulate, we need to create the mesh. And the important function here is also within the mesh tools package and it's called create mesh. Um, so this is the function we will be using it. In Jupyter Lab, if you put a question mark behind the function, you also get the documentation and um, a very uh, powerful tool or very general uh, feature of Python is that you that it's open source. So you can also put a second question mark, which will give you also not only the fun function signature, but also the code behind it. So you can always see what is happening behind the curtain. Um, and this create mesh function takes the our geometry as the very first argument. So this is a, a piecewise linear complex. So the first object here. And I will call this the mesh, which we will be using in the following. And I can also visualize it with the PG show high level function. Again, PG show is um, capable of showing many different types of Python objects um, or PyGimli objects. And it basically then distributes to the individual show functions. So we have uh, PG and this comes with a viewer interface. And then we have uh, in 2D MPL and um, PyVista in 3D. And, um, and this has a show mesh function. And if PG show uh, gets a mesh, it basically distributes to that function and also passes on the keyword arguments. And there are a lot of settings that we um, can use to make nice figures. Okay, but I will be using PG show here just because it's a bit shorter, but keep in mind, it's just a, an entry point. And this can take the mesh. And this would be with default settings. So just um, calling the triangle mesh generator and populating the geom ge geometric object, which we defined earlier and accounting for these boundaries and the objects we defined. Um, if we want to do finite element simulations with this later, then we also need to be aware of, of mesh quality. Um, so we don't we want to avoid sharp edges. So um, we need a high quality mesh also to get, to get the um, for high numerical accuracy. And also when we do an inversion, we also have to be aware of of our mesh because the each triangle would represent a subsurface parameter, and we want these uh, parameters to be um, in a, yeah, um, to be according to the resolution of our method. Okay, so we look at the keyword arguments that we can specify here. And the first thing is quality. And the quality basically um, represents the smallest allowed angle with, within each triangle. So if I would set this to a very low value, let's say five degrees, then I would get a very low quality mesh. I can increase this further. Um, so this doesn't look much different, maybe 20. Uh, we see to, to achieve a quality of 20, so to have angles which are at least larger than 20 degrees, we also need more cells. So the quality also um, scales, um, correlates with the number of cells which we have in the end. And some reasonable values are usually between 33 and 34. Maybe I'm going with 33.5 here, which looks like a um, yeah nice quality mesh, so nicely shaped triangles. And there's also a tutorial on the website which um, showing also how to calculate and how to visualize mesh quality. Okay. Um, another thing, if we have a high quality mesh, 
we also need to be aware of the number of cells we have. And this can be specified with the area keyword, which is basically the maximum allowed area of each triangle. Um, and if I put this to a high number, um, then nothing will change here because it will still need to satisfy this quality factor. And to get the quality, it needs some cells. Um, so it, it doesn't affect anything if I'm having a larger number here, but it will affect if I'm using a smaller number because um, then I'm specifying the maximum cell and it still needs to obey this quality criterion. Um, one last thing maybe is to use the uh, smoothing. So it calls an additional smoothing algorithm of the mesh generator. So, and this yeah, looks like a pretty nice mesh that we can use in the following. And um, we will pick up on this mesh and um, you also have it within the Git repository. And you can save the mesh with the save method. And we just have to provide a file name so we can just save it as mesh.bms. And um, the geometry is a little bit different because it, we also need the um, geometrical definitions of the boundaries and the regions. And then we have the um, export PLC function. So exporting a piecewise linear complex, which takes the geometry as the first object and then um, also file name. So I'm just calling this geometry, which you can then reuse later. Okay, um, so to in the interest of time, I will um, go to the ready-made notebook that you also have available um, and talk a bit about mesh um, mesh modifications. So how can we um, modify the mesh we created? And um, one first thing would be tr translating mesh. So I'm doing a copy here, I'm calling PG mesh, which basically um, just creates another instance of the mesh so we can keep the unmodified version of it. And the mesh comes with different methods. And one method would be translate, where I can provide um, scaling um, translation factors in the different uh, spatial dimensions. So here, the mesh would look very similar, um, but the well, X and Y labels have changed, so the position of the nodes have changed because I shifted the complete mesh by 500 meters along the x-axis and by 25 meters along the y-axis. Um, another modifying method would be scaling. So I can call the scale method of each mesh. And I can say, OK, the x dimension stays the same, but I want to um, exaggerate the um, vertical dimension. And that would, of course, uh, keep in mind that this will also affect the mesh quality. Um, so you could look at mesh quality before and after the mesh modification. Um, another thing is rotate, which takes the a vector of the rotational axis. And this is defined in, in radian. So I'm using the um, degree to radian um, NumPy function here. And I'm rotating by 20 degrees. And this will just uh, put a yeah, little uh, tilt in my model. So uh, slope, for example. And another form of mesh modification is extrusion. So I can take a surface a topography, so just a line, a one-dimensional mesh, and can extrude it into the subsurface, into a two-dimensional mesh. Or I can take a two-dimensional mesh and extrude it into the third dimension. And this third dimension is provided here. So um, just takes a NumPy array with different positions in the this added dimension. And then I'm rotating it here again, just to show you that, um, that this method we used before, rotate, also works on a three-dimensional mesh. Because keep in mind, this extrude mesh on a 2D mesh will produce a 3D mesh. And we can visualize this with the help of PyVista. So make sure to check out Bain Sullivan's tutorial tomorrow, where you will learn much more about this uh, wonderful software package. OK. Um, 
So I will conclude with the uh, message that everything I showed you, um, so creating a geometrical objects, creating a mesh, also applies in 3D. In 3D, our uh, mesh tools are a bit more limited, so uh, we are looking forward to any contributions in this area. But again, we have uh, this read mesh IO, where you can basically uh, read any type of mesh format, and we are very much looking forward to the subsurface integration. And But everything else here, so we have, instead of create rectangle, we have create uh, cube, create cylinders, or so some three-dimensional objects. But we can also add them together, as we did with the two-dimensional objects. We can call create mesh on them. And we also have the same modifying methods, rotating, scaling, and everything we did for 2D is equally applicable to 3D. Um, and this would just be a three-dimensional cube and this cylinder added together. And yeah, um, with that, this concludes this first part. And Thomas will now use the geometry which we just defined to show you how to simulate something with it. Yeah, thanks, Florian. Uh, yeah, now we have some nice meshes. We can work with those meshes. And what we're going to do is to switch to the next higher level, which is the lowermost level, is the equation level. So doing modeling on equation uh, uh, basis. And what we're going to do is here to model the steady state heat equation. It's a very, very simple equation. And we are we want to use the previously created mesh, uh, associate some, uh, some some surface properties to solve a Poisson type equation with finite elements, visualize the results, and do some interpolation stuff. I'm also starting on the stretch. Uh, we're using here the heat equation, which is a Poisson equation of this type. So the divergence of a of a gradient multiplied by some uh, uh, factor a uh, is equal to to some right side. Uh, for the heat equation, this can be translated in the uh, the unknown temperature uh, is depending on heat source F on the right-hand side and a term of divisivity. And, and it's just a continuity equation. It, it's just the same as, as in DC, uh, DC resistivity, where this is the electrical conductivity and this is the potential. On the right-hand side, we have the current uh, density. But we also can do this on the uh, on modeling Darcy's law. Then this would be the head, and, and this is the, the hydraulic conductivity. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's a very simple equation. We want to model this only steady state. So A is the thermal divisivity that we will use now. We will not place a heat source because this will mostly lead to the non-stationary uh, stuff. Uh, but, we, but what we want to look at is to play with different boundary conditions, directly or normal flow boundary conditions. So we start up with a, uh, with a notebook as follows. So, so we again import by given the SPG and also the show mesh function. There's just another way uh, of, of using factors like those from polygamy import viewer. But what we want to do is to is to resolve by finite elements, and there's a very uh, 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 easy entry point is pg.solves, which is solving the uh, the partial differential equation here with a function solve finite element. We're gonna have a look at this in on the website. But this is a very uh, a generalized uh, uh, model of a parabolic uh, partial differential equation. So we have a parabolic term of a, of a change of a, of a variable u, u. Then on the right-hand side, we have a, an elliptic term, just as I showed you before. But that's also a, a, a Helmholtz term and a, and a right-hand side uh, source. And additionally, we have uh, uh, a boundary conditions on this boundary value problem. So we can have Dirichlet boundary conditions. We can have Neumann boundary conditions. Uh, so directly, we are specifying the, the value of u on the boundary, whereas in Neumann boundary conditions, we specify the, the normal derivative, but we also can combine them into mixed boundary conditions and uh, two different uh, uh, types of doing this. So you can dive into this uh, a little bit more. But we're going to back to, uh, to use this pq.solve with a mesh that we created before. So what, are, what we're going to do is to load the mesh that we have created before. So uh, you just use the convenience function pg.load. And if you look into your data folder, you can see there, there are several files that we're going to use for this uh, tutorial. And there's the and there's the mesh.bms that Florian just saved. Uh, let me just let me just use it. Uh, let me just load it from here. Print it. Oh my god. 
yeah, it's data, of course. So it's a mesh consisting of 1,300 nodes and 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 2,600 cells. And uh, yeah, we want to show mesh. The mesh that's what we did before. So the mesh is looking like this. We we're going to get rid of this uh, output here. Uh, what we want to show is the markers. I mean, now we see the markers, which is both the cell markers in the subsurface going from from zero to three, but we also see the boundary markers, and, and those will come into play right now when we do the modeling. So we just have to remember uh, the the top boundary is is marked by a boundary marker minus one, and all other boundaries are marked by a boundary marker minus two. If you want to show the mesh additionally, we can easily look into the uh, in the signature of a show mesh, and then we can say show mesh. Yes, show mesh equals true, and then we see both the markers and the mesh. Then we want to populate those cell markers with some values, with some with some subsurface values. And that's why uh, we are creating a map of of a, of a thermal kind of field, of a thermal facility A, and we just create a map which is a list of mapping objects. So we're just saying, uh, well, we have a region zero, which is the middle layer. And then just give it the value of 1.0. Uh, then we have a, a region one, which is uh, having a, a thermal conductivity of five, which is a bit uh, higher, which is the top layer. Then we have uh, the lowermost layer, which is having the, uh, the highest thermal conductivity uh, of 10. And then we are having region number three, which is the which is the blob here, and in this blob we get an even higher uh, conductivity. And we're gonna use this. If we look into show mesh, we can we not only specify a mesh, we can also specify some data that are populated with this. So those data can be a long vector equaling the uh, number of nodes, number of cells, but it can also be a map. So what we're gonna do here is to uh, visualize uh, the map uh, thermal conductivity and we see here's a, 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 a the, the the image of a of a summer conductivity. So we have a value of one here, a value of five here, a value of ten and twenty, twenty in upper mass. So if you want to do, we could also look at this in the log scale. If this property is is meaningful to be looked at the log scale, and then we can uh, just do it, and then then we have a a, a log scaling of summer conductivities. Okay. Those are the ones that we are going to use. And for the next step, we we have to define some boundary conditions. So I'm specifying this via a dictionary object. So the first uh, part of a dictionary, the key, is called directly. And this means we are specifying directly boundary conditions. And and then in and then the value of this dictionary is a is again a dictionary. Uh, where we specify the uh, the boundary marker of minus one. You remember it's the top uh, surface with a value of five. So we have five degrees uh, on on the top, and we have on on all boundaries we have twelve degrees on the bottom. Now we're gonna call uh, PG that solve. What we need for this is uh, the mesh, and we need a uh, Activity. Then we need some boundary conditions, and we and we have an all uh, uh, function, mostly a verbose uh, flag that is telling us, please tell us something what you're doing, and uh, this is doing uh, this is using the mesh. This is doing some assembly, and this is solving uh, the system, which is of course very very fast because that's that's easy. And now we're gonna show the result. So we. Uh, Again, use the function show mesh, and we use this function, and we get some some message here. And to to make the uh, plotting equal for the next time, I'm using a uh, few more options. So I'm using the data t. So I'm showing the the temperature here. I'm giving it a label. I'm using a different uh, color map. I'm using for temperature I'm using the hot map, which is very nice. And I'm saying I'm wanna I want to have 11 uh, levels of the of the control lines, and I want to show the boundary. 
So now we see the boundary here with black dots and we see the temperature, which is uh, five degrees on the, on the top and it's, uh, and it's 12 degrees on, on our opposite. So, so we see our boundary conditions are, are sufficient and uh, there's an almost uh, constant conduct, uh, there's an almost constant temperature in the top layer because the thermal conductivity is so low. Then, then in the second layer, the, the temperature is, is, is increasing. And then in the top layer, it's, uh, uh, in the bottom layer, it's, it's, uh, it's constant again because, because the conductivity is high. And this is the same also for the, for the blob here. Just to show you some, some different boundary conditions, I, I'm going to use a mix of boundary, uh, a mix of directly and normal boundary conditions. So, so in this type, I'm also, uh, I'm only using, uh, Boundary conditions on on the top, which is 20 degrees uh, on the surface, and in all other boundaries, I use a Neumann boundary condition, which means some outflow. It's a negative number, some outflow on the on all the other numbers, and I'm going to compute this. Now we have 20 degrees on top, and um, and we see uh, there's there's some outflow almost perpendicular to the boundary uh, that we see in the subsurface. Okay, I'm going to go back to the to the original problem and and what we want to do now is this is a post person actually uh, we want to have a look at the at the heat flow so for for drawing streams or or, or streamlines there's a function uh, called for streams that we import from pygimli.viewer and then we call again the same show mesh function that we used before but at this time we return the axis and the color bar to it. So every show function has got two return arguments, which is the axis that we plot. It's a map little axis in, in the 2D case. So we can plot whatever we want to into this axis, labeling, uh, placing dots or, or text or whatever. And the second one is the color bar. And it's the, and in this, uh, and in this axis, we are additionally, uh, plotting some streams. And we're going to proceed with a, uh, we're going to call it with a mesh and the temperature. It's generating the, the streamlines of this temperature field. And now we see it uh, here in the subsurface. It's not only the temperature field, but we also see the, see the heat flow, how it's going to the, to the surface and how it's entering the, uh, the boundaries of our mesh. Okay. Next thing is a very important feature. Uh, is interpolation because we often want to work uh, on different meshes. We want to go to some different program, and that's why we often want to interpolate uh, our uh, our models, uh, our properties to some other uh, stuff. So what I'm doing now is to create uh, another mesh. So far, we only have worked with triangular prism meshes, but now we are we are gonna uh, generate a grid. I already prepared some uh, some vectors. So I'm generating a grid which is going from minus 25 to 25 in one meter steps, and also from minus 25 to zero in one meter steps. And I'm gonna show this grid. For this, we see we, we need to import NumPy. And see this grid down here. Actually, we wanna have this temperature uh, distribution on the grid. So what we're going to do, is to is to retrieve a temperature on the grid, and for this we we are using PG interpolate. Again, we can look into the into the dark string, which is quite large because there are many many different ways of doing interpolation. And we use an input mesh, which is which is our mesh that our solution is existing, and then we have some output, and this could be the grid. But we are uh, we can specifically uh, uh, interpolate the results onto the cell centers. So we are interpolating to a point set uh, which is consisting of a cell center. And here for showing, we, we use the same plot as before, but only using grid and T grid here. Now we have uh, what we usually do in inversion. We have a, a constant temperature in each cell because it is uh, because the temperature distribution has been interpolated onto the cell centers. And, uh, and this is uh, representing the, uh, 
the distribution of t on the grid. But you can also do something uh, something very similar by just uh, making a copy of this. And now we are going to uh, interpolate not on the cell samples, but on the cell nodes. Now we have again uh, a contour line representation like before. But the solution is now living on the on the node. So we have the number of nodes uh, for the T grid instead of the, instead of the number of sets. So this could also be uh, uh, different kinds of interpolation. Interpolation is is basically included into the finite element because finite element uh, operator is an interpolation operator. And what else could we do? We are very uh, very often are, are interested only in a only a small amount of uh, uh, of the data. So what we uh, can do right now, and I'm going to copy this, is to produce a temperature lock. Maybe we're, maybe we are interested in how is the temperature behaving along this line as it, it, at x equals zero down the line. So what we're going to do is to is to produce a numpy uh, vector which is going from zero to 25, and then we are then we are uh, doing a list comprehension of positions. The x position is zero, and the and the set position is minus d because because set counts upwards, and so we have minus d, and we run through those steps and generate a position vector, and then we interpolate not on the grid but on the position vector, and all the rest is just plotting. So I'm just plotting this temperature curve uh, on the uh, on the uh, uh, depth axis. What we need for this is uh, is a multiplet path, a plot function, uh, and we import this as PLT. So it's it's in the ready made notebook, but I just forgot to to call this. Uh, well, if you like, you can. Uh, Add a grid to it so that you can see the temperature behavior. So now we have a temperature depth log at position x equals zero, which is uh, starting at five degrees. Our upper boundary then is constant because the, it's a constant conductivity. Uh, but then there's a then there's another uh, gradient in the second layer. And then there's another gradient in the third layer, and this is basically uh, the second layer has a has a, uh, a lower gradient. Then we have the body that we're diving through. So we have the layer one, layer two going from here to here, and layer three, and this is the body. So, so basically, we see the uh, uh, the thermal diffusivity in the gradient of a temperature depth log. You can see the whole notebook if you're uh, just clicking on the on the uh, on the whole notebook, and there's some some additional stuff on numerical accuracy if you want to solve an equation on a on a higher, on a highly refined mesh, then then you can then you can go into this one. But I will stop right here, and now we switch to uh, to our time forward calculation. Okay, so we will continue with the first geophysical method. So Thomas showed you the general equation level, um, where you can come with a with your own partial differential equation. But for the geophysical problems, we have a lot of ready-made forward operators. And the one we will be using here is uh, travel time modeling. And the steps we need to do is reading the geometry, same as Thomas used for the heat equation, so the one that we defined, um, and that you can also manipulate and um, modify to your liking. We have to define the sources and the receivers. Um, so where do we actually, um, where do the rays start and end? And where do we take the travel time measurements? We need to populate the subsurface with any um, physical parameters. And in this case, it will be the seismic slowness. And then in the end, we will simulate and we will also add noise to the data um, for our synthetic experiment. You are familiar with these first two lines, importing PyGimli as PG. And also the mesh tools package, we, we know this already. Uh, what is new here is now the travel time module. So all the physical submodules are in uh, in the physics submodule, and we will be using travel time and then ERT later on. And we give this the shortcut TT. Um, and we will start by reading in the geometry. And um, so Thomas used the mesh already. Um, and I still need to modify geometry a bit. So I'm um, 
not using the final mesh, but the geometry that we saved. And we, uh, it's in your data folder, and it's called geometry poly and we can read it with the read plc function and you also have a link to the documentation up here so let's make sure that it looks the way we um, intend it to be yes that's our geometry for a cross hole setup i will just um, scale it a bit um, to get yeah, to have something more narrow mm. so this is just uh, dividing the, the uh, width of our model to 30 meters in total. Um, so the first thing we need to do, we need to specify our sources. And for, for doing that, we will import the NumPy package, and we will define the sources and receivers as, um, as a NumPy array of positions. So let's say we have 10, borehole, uh, 10 sensors, so um, geophones and um, and sources in each borehole. So let's define the one borehole. Could be defined like this. So uh, 10 rows, meaning 10 receivers and two columns for X and Y position. And I'm already scaling this by 10 meters to make it the right borehole. And I need to specify the <clears throat> the y coordinates. So the this is every everything is homogeneous. So we have the x coordinates are the same. <clears throat> everything is ten meters. But for the y y coordinate, we need something that is changing, and it will be changing from a little bit below the surface, so minus point five meters, um, down to minus thirty meters. Remember that our total depth here was 25 meters. And we want n uh, positions, so 10. OK, so let's have a look at this two-dimensional um, object with x and y positions. And now I will do the same thing for the second borehole. So I'm multiplying this by 2. <clears throat> and I'm um, scaling the x-coordinate. Um, so move it to minus 10 meters, while the y coordinates stay the same. So if I'm, I'm doing that, and I'm just looking at the first um, 13 positions, we see the source is fired at um, x equal to 10, and then at all depth levels. And then we have the uh, second ball. <clears throat> OK, and now we want to visualize the sensors, and we can do this by the um, plot command, so we can use, um, oh, let's visualize the geometry first. We can call pg show on our geometry, and uh, this returns the matplotlib axis, and we can draw additional things on top of that axis. So we are just using the plot method to um, plot our sensor's coordinates. So. positions and I positions. And let's make it red dots. Um, okay, so these are my sources and receivers um, left and right from the anomaly that we want to image. So I just defined them in a NumPy array. What I need to do now is I need to add them to the geometry. So I'm iterating over every position in the sensor position that I have defined. And for every position, I'm calling our geometrical object. And this geometry has a method called um, create node. And I can hand over the position to it. And what I also need to do, I need to create a mesh on top of this geometry. So I'm calling the create mesh function again that you're already familiar with. We use some sensible settings like quality 33.5 and an area of 1. And look at the resulting mesh again. Okay. 
Um, so it looks as expected, but note that um, if I plot the sensor positions again on top of that geometry, you would see that they coincide with node positions now. Um, for the forward modeling, um, it's not totally necessary, but it's uh, necessary to have uh, accurate um, travel time simulations. Okay, um, so the next step would be to populate our subsurface with parameters. And um, Thomas showed you the way how to do this with um, on a region basis. So if I'm saying um, markers equal to true here, and maybe also show mesh equal to true, We could use these region markers 0, 1, 2, and 3 again to populate uh, the mesh with properties. Um, but we could also do this on a cell by cell basis. Um, and this is very flexible. So you could, for example, read in um, a simulation output out of a flow and transport simulation and reuse that to calculate the geophysical response. So we will do a NumPy array of velocities. And here I'm using five entries for one, two, three, and uh, four, or four entries, sorry, one, two, three, and four. Um, so these four entries with 800 meters per second, 500, 1,000, and 2,000. And I'm mapping this with the cell markers. So the mesh contains many different methods. Um, and we have full flexibility, so we can also uh, iterate for, for every cell in mesh cells, for example, and print the cell center. And I'm just doing this for the first five to not to have too much output. And for every cell now, we could do another for loop and iterate over the nodes. So we have access to all the entries in this mesh object. And um, we also have access to the mesh cell markers, and this will map our five val four values now to all the cell markers. And this only works because the Python uses zero-based indexing and we have the marker zero within that mesh. Otherwise, you would need to account for that by subtracting one here. Um, okay, and this has more than uh, 1,000 entries and this coincides with the number of cells. So if we print the mesh, we see that we also have 1,380 cells. And to check if everything was mapped correctly, I'm plotting the mesh against our vector that we just created. And we um, see our subsurface model. So this would be the label that I can provide. We have the PG unit with some predefined defaults. So this would be the default for velocity uh, in meters per second. Um, OK, so now I have the mesh. I have added the sensors, but I haven't specified what do I really want to measure. So um, where do the rays start and end? And um, for that, we have a convenience function, which is called um, create crosshole data. And it takes the sensor position, and it basically um, provides the rays of every possible combination uh, between the boreholes. And this returns a data container. And you can um, yeah, think of a data container a bit like um, Panda's data frame. So it comes with different columns. And you can see the entries here. So it's labeled data. And we have G for the geophones and S for the sources. And um, we also have the sender positions. These are also part of the scheme file. and um, now we will iterate over sources and receivers. So S and G again, um, source and the geophones. And now I'm iterating over these two arrays. So every shot and geophone position, um, which makes up one ray. And if I'm just maybe looking at the first five of this, um, okay, so. 
this does not work. Um, yeah, let's look at all of them. Um, you see that these are just the connections between the sources and the receivers in the right borehole. And these are not the actual physical ray paths. Keep in mind that the ray paths are also dependent on the model, so it's a nonlinear problem. And Thomas will show you this um, later. So this, this is just the connection between the geophones that we use for the measurements. OK, um, so now we have everything. And um, after um, the break, we will talk a bit more about managers. and. Um, Thomas will introduce you to this travel time manager during the inversion. Here I'm only using one function out of it, and this is the simulate function. The simulate function takes the mesh we already created. It takes the scheme that we created before, and it takes <clears throat> um, the subsurface properties, so the slowness values, which would be in our case here, one over v. We can also specify the velocity, but um, you have to name the right keyword argument. Okay, and then um, other important keyword arguments here are secondary nodes. These are additional nodes placed on the edges, so on the lines in 2D and on triangles in a, a three-dimensional tetrahedral mesh, for example. And these allow the um, Race to pass through the cells at different angles, so it increases the accuracy of the travel time simulation. So I'm using four additional nodes here on every edge. I'm specifying a noise level, um, which would be 0.1%, and but we usually define the um, noise for travel time measurements in absolute terms. Could be a triggering offset, for example. This would be in the same units as we have the um, data, so in seconds. And then we can also provide the NumPy seed to create the Gaussian distributed noise so that we have this reproducible for our um, research work. OK, and this runs. And um, yeah, I should have saved it. So this would be the data. And this will, again, um, provide me with a data container. So the scheme that we put in here was also a data container, but it did not contain the actual data yet. So just the sensor positions and the um, measurement schedule. But if I print this data container now, I see that it has an additional column. And these are the travel times. And um, you can also sub um, extract each column and do some post-processing with, with it. Here we have a function in the travel time module to calculate the shot and receiver distance. And you could use the simulated travel time here, so the data t, to calculate apparent velocities, for example. And um, yeah, I'm just finishing with this plot, showing the apparent velocities at each geophone and depth position. And you see that it uh, apparent velocities increase with depth, um, which is also coinciding with our uh, subsurface model. OK, um, this was everything on travel time modeling. And we will continue with the inversion side of things <clears throat> after a little break until uh, 10 after, so um, in seven minutes. OK, so thank you all for watching this first half and see you in the second half. Welcome back. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, some fresh air, some fresh coffee. Uh, we're going to proceed with what we did before uh, with travel time. Now we want to do some inversion of this data. And I want to show you some introduction to the 
to the method managers. So uh, we are now at notebook number four, and we're going to start from scratch again. So what we have before uh, is a data set. So what we want to do is learn, learn the method manager and the way they work. We want to invert those data in player one with some inversion options just to get, just to get a feeling how PyGimli is working and what, what we have. Uh, OK. So we started with the typical import stuff, and then we're starting to in, uh, include the data. For this, we, we load in the mesh. We're using the travel time uh, module TT, which is also a convenience function load. And we're going to load in the data travel time dot that. And we can print this data, see what's in there. So we have 20 sensors. We have 100 uh, data, 10 by 10, 2 times 10. And then we have different fields in the in the model, so we have the geophone uh, field, the uh, uh, the shot field, the geophone field, and we have the model travel times t. But we also have the error uh, in the in the column error here. So what we have a so what we're going to do is have a look at the data because we haven't looked at the data itself. So uh, we could uh, easily include a nice uh, function. In fact, give me there's a there's a lot of nice functions. You can explore them in the viewer function. In the NPA, there's a function called show back matrix, which is doing nothing else than showing uh, uh, vectors in a matrix form. So we're going to generate some data, uh, some data pseudo section or something like this. So we so we could show some show back matrix, and we're going to use this data. So on the x-axis. We take the shot number. On the y-axis, we take the geophone number. And on the on the value table, we take the, the travel time. We forgot the import. So now we have a plot of our data. So the, so the data are the travel time data, t. On the x-axis, we have a, a, the, the short number. On the, on the y-axis, we have the two for number. So the first one are, are numbered from 0 to 9, and the others are numbered from 10 to 19. Uh, actually, we would have we would like to have some more plotting, so that's why I generated uh, a nice function for it, uh, which is also showing the same metric. But instead of uh, numbers, I'm using the depths. So I'm indexing. The, the geophone uh, 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 numbers and shot numbers with the depths and show this vec this vec matrix and and we're gonna pass all quarks our keyword argument that we have which is for instance the label so we so we're gonna plot the data travel time here so now we have the shot depths in meters which is 0 0.5 to 23 and we have the geophone depths in meters. And we see the, the highest travel times occur where the, where the shot and the geophone are very low. Uh, and, the, and the lowest travel times occur in the middle where our uh, fast velocity plot is residing. So we can see something uh, already in the data. Uh, we could, if we don't have noise on the data, we could also do this right here. And I'm going to uh, do this right now. We could add some additional noise. Let's say we want to include uh, 0 0.1 milliseconds of additional data. So what we are going to do is to have a look at the data. And we are we're using the, the time window and adding some uh, random noise. Therefore, we're using the, uh, the NumPy package, uh, numpy.random, and we're using Gaussian random noise. Remember, uh, uh, we are dealing with L. L2 inversion, so it's always uh, a Gaussian number. So we're we're generating a random number uh, of Gaussian values and multiply it with the error value, which is in this case dt. And finally, we also add this to the error because now the error has changed. And just add this dt to the error. 
you don't have errors, we can do this right now. Okay, that's not a big change, but we can look at the uh, at the personal data now, whether, whether they have visually changed. Now we see uh, there's some more error on the data, which is uh, kind of big, uh, but, but we're gonna see whether we can uh, extract something out of it. Okay, first thing we need for an inversion is a mesh. That's why we are creating a, a regular grid mesh. So we have uh, generated the synthetic data with a, a triangular uh, mesh, but we are not gonna use this mesh. This is an inverse crime to use the same mesh for the inversion as for the forward calculation. So that's why we're creating a new mesh. And I've, and I've prepared some uh, X and Y vectors, which is going from the minimum of our data positions to the maximum of our, of our data positions in X, using 15 steps in this case, and, and the same for the for the right data. And then you're gonna uh, show this grid that we generate by the uh, convenience function uh, rate grid x and y. And we're gonna show this here. Uh, now we have this grid. We're gonna see our sensors. That's why we are gonna uh, add something more. But additionally, uh, we are returning again the axis and color bar objects and plotting the sensors uh, with red markers on it. And then we see the mesh. So we have the, the leftmost borehole here and we have the rightmost borehole here and we discretize the subsurface uh, into, uh, into rectangles and all rays should go in, in this model. So we don't need any outer space that we have in the, in the forward calculation. Okay. Now we're gonna uh, proceed creating a, a manager. We call this manager MGR. And this is a travel time manager. We can initialize this already with the data. And we can see what's in the manager and we can explore a little bit uh, which kind of uh, stuff do we have in the manager. So we can, uh, we can apply some mesh Externally, we can check our data, we can check our errors, uh, we can create a mesh automatically, we can draw ray paths, we can uh, uh, access forward operator and inversion objects, uh, meshes, and everything that, that's in the inversion is inside this manager. So we won't go into detail right now in this tutorial, but, but, we, can, uh, uh, but we can use a few of those functions like show result and, and show ray paths and whatever. So this manager is is the final entry point. Once you have, once you have initialized uh, initialized this, you can uh, access everything that's in the data, in the inversion results, in the inversion itself uh, by the manager object. The main uh, thing that we are going to use is uh, the uh, the main uh, the invert function. So we're going to invert the data, and we're going to use the the grid that we have previously generated, and uh, well, I could also give a starting model. And uh, let's say we are inverting right now for the slowness. So actually we're using a starting model of 1000 uh, meters per second, but this could also be different. Uh, I could start with uh, using a gradient model. This would be typical for a fraction size mix, but in this case, I don't need a, need a gradient model. And uh, I can also specify some additional options. Like the secondary nodes that uh, are flowing through And I'm choosing three secondary nodes. I will write, uh, show you what this means. And I could uh, start the inversion. And now I have a problem. So uh, this shouldn't happen. Okay. So it seems like our additional error was a bit uh, too high. So we're gonna start from scratch again, reading in the data. Almost uh, noise-free data than the noisify data. So we have uh, data that, uh, that are both uh, Uh, 
aggregated data. So we have uh, uh, travel time data that are below uh, one. Two is, is to use a data filter. So we're just saying uh, data t is smaller than zero, or maybe smaller and, and equal to zero, and filter them. Uh, filter them out and then uh, then showing the uh, showing the causal data again seeing whether there are all data remaining and we see a lot of data have been removed obviously I did something wrong when typing I'm sorry for that oh yes there's, there's something I did terribly wrong. I uh, typed a plus instead of a minus. So adding data, I don't want to manipulate data. Now we see the, now we see the uh, noise on the data is not very big because I, I decreased it. So I'm doing it again with a smaller noise. Uh, sorry about this uh, time. Noise free data. Now I'm adding uh, 0.1 millisecond to the data and for the cross all data. And now we see uh, noise a little bit uh, increased. And uh, now we're going to see that nothing is filtered, but uh, our inversion should be running. Actually, the inversion was telling us uh, that, that there are uh, travel data, data below zero, and this shouldn't happen. So now the inversion is running. I apologize for this uh, inconvenience. So we uh, see the inversion has been running, but we don't see any output. So again, like above, we use purpose is true. And we see some output. We see the travel time uh, for the modeling object. We have a linear data transformation on the data. We have a, log a logarithmic data transformation on the model. Then we're going to see the course of a of iterations, and we're going to start with a chi square of 11, and it's go down, and it goes down to almost uh, one, as it should be. So now we are entitled to look at the at the inversion result, and we just type uh, uh, manager for result, and we have a a result of our final velocity. Note that it is automatically uh, converted to velocity. What you can see if you compare this to the uh, synthetic data, we see the low velocity layer over here. We can uh, see, we can almost see the higher velocity layer here, but it's really badly reserved. But what we, but what we can see in the middle is, is a high, is a high velocity uh, blob uh, here. But what you can do is play around with inversion a little bit. And for this, I'm going to uh, add the, the show result directly after the inversion result so that we can play a little bit uh, Along with this. So we can uh, so we can change the regularization uh, uh, strength by the parameter uh, lambda. So you can use a very high regularization strength for the inversion. And we're gonna see in a few in a few iterations uh, that the that the model will be very smooth, but uh, but with a very high regularization, we, we cannot reach the data fit of chi square one. And the model is very smooth. So we can further decrease it to 100, which is probably the uh, the default value that, that we have used before. So now we see a faster decreasing, we're reaching 1.6. So we are reaching uh, chi square one. So actually, we are going below chi square one, which means we should increase our, our model because otherwise we are overfitting the data. And uh, and now we should uh, reach a point where we actually uh, end up in chi square one. So we could uh, do this automatically. There's also a, a scheme where we uh, where we uh, Optimize this parameter so that Casca one is exactly uh, reached by by section. So we are increasing and, and decreasing the model until we really reach Casca one. We could also use echo methods, and there's a lot of stuff in there. 
So now we are again uh, pretty much close to the uh, to the value of one. And we're going to show the result, but again we are going to uh, uh, give back the axis. And what we also can do uh, is to use the uh, convenience function show ray paths. We're plotting the ray paths on the axis, and of course we should also give a model. Show repo, but, but actually you want to use uh, the function draw ray paths. Now we see the ray paths going from the shots to the sensors. So the shots are on the left hand side and the sensors on the right hand side, and we can see that they uh, they are not linear and they are not uh, restricted to the nodes uh, of a mesh, but they are cutting. So they are piecewise linear, but uh, this is what we are controlling with a, a, a seg node. So a seg node, every edge is is uh, split into several nodes, like Florian uh, showed you on the on the triangle before. And if you increase the secondary nodes, the, the computational accuracy will will be in, increased, but of course uh, at at some additional computational costs. And we see the rays are are tending to go through these uh, fast blob in the middle, and which which we can probably uh, pretty much uh, resolve at least to the resolution limits that we have uh, regarding our data, our data accuracy. What you usually want to do is to is to have a look at the at the data fit, and we can just and we can use our uh, previously defined defined function. So we're going to use a a matplotlib uh, subplot, so two subplots next to each other, and, and we show the crosser data once we show the the measured data. And the other one we can access the inversion. So having MGR inversion, then we can access all the inversion stuff. So we can have a look at the chi-square history. We can look at the absolute RMS. We can we can uh, modify whatever we need, like the maximum iteration number, the model history. We, we can access uh, the model response and things like this. And we're going to use the model response right here and show it next to the data, uh, which are looking quite similar. So we can visually really nicely explain our data and that's why we're gonna have a look at the misfit which is the uh the measured data minus the the forward response and and for plotting misfits uh we are usually using the uh such a blue white red color scale so which is uh zero center so that zero means uh perfectly matched and and uh Red is above zero and, and blue is below zero, and we see uh, and we see uh, what a patchy of uh, of blue and red values, which means we don't have much structure. So there's only one value here which can hardly be fitted. This could be some some outlier in the data, or it could be some problem. So we could deal with that uh, with additional options like uh, robust data. This will iteratively rewrite the the data. We can have a look at the result. So the so the case square is really very fastly going under under one. And if you uh, look at the misfit, so if we look at the misfit, uh, it is uh, yeah not too much. Decreasing, but this very single value does not remain. So apparently, there's something still, still in the in the leftmost sensor. But otherwise, the data are really uh, uh, the data misfit is really nice because this is one one important thing that, that people should look at is the misfit is the is the, the histogram of a misfit and and the, and the distribution of a misfit. And if you and if we are uh, ending on ending up in a non-correlated Gaussian uh, data of a misfit. Uh, we are entitled to look at a model. In this case, we know the error, but but in many cases we don't we don't have an idea of the error. That's why uh, for field data it will be very important to look at the data. This is the next point we're coming to uh, is field data, and we're gonna uh, switch to ERT now. Florian. Okay, so. You saw the inversion, how the method managers are structured, and we use that for a synthetic travel time data set. 
And now two things will change. We will move to another geophysical method, ERT. Um, and also we will move from synthetic to field data. But you will see that uh, a lot a lot of other things also stay similar. Um, and since we use another geophysical method, we also have to import another sub package. So we go to pygimli.physics um, again. And now don't use the travel time, but the ERT module. <clears throat> and um, we will be loading a field data set, which is in your data folder, which is in the Git repository, was acquired at a beach of the uh, island Borkum, um, northern Germany. And um, we will use that here as a demonstration. So we will click in this data container, and we will have a look at the data container again. We're just printing it, so it tells us we have 81 um, electrodes this time. Uh, roughly 1,500 um, four-point configurations and many more columns now. So A, B mark the current injecting electrodes, M and N mark the potential measuring electrodes. We have the injected current I, the measured potential U, the resistance, so the ratio of the two of them. And um, what we need to process um, is then the geometrical factors. Um, so that we are able to calculate apparent resistivities. So let's, before we do that, let's have a look at the topography. Um, so the data container also contains the sensor positions and we can visualize them. We can call the PGX command on the data container. And we're looking at the vertical positions, data again, and let's link them. And to have equal sizing, we set the aspect ratio to one. OK, so you see that there's um, towards the coast, there's some topography, but um, not much topography. So just these five meters over 160 meters. Um, so the topography effect, which we will explore now, will be uh, of minor relevance. The analytical formulas for geometric factors that you know from the textbooks are only valid for a homogeneous half space or so for flat surface. We can also have buried so sources for uh, um, for crosshold setups, for example, but they don't work if we have topography anymore. Um, so we need to recalculate them. Also, if you read in data from an instrument, the instrument does not know about the topography, so it will likely, if it gives k factors, then um, just the ones, just the analytical ones. In the ERT module, there's this function create geometric factors. We will have a look at the um, arguments it takes. It just takes the data container. And um, we can set it to true, numerical to true, meaning that we will calculate the geometric factors numerically. And this means basically a forward simulation on a homogeneous model um, with a fine mesh um, and accounting for this topography. And then we do the same thing again. So I'm copy pasting this line, um, but I'm setting this numerical to false. So we use the analytical formula. So I'm naming this K analytically. And we do this. And it will tell me that it is restoring the cache. So we have a PG cache operator, which you can um, put to functions which are of uh, computationally more expensive. So you can restore, restore um, the output of that function if the input arguments to the function did not change. So if the da data did not change here, then it will just give me the um, geometric factors, which it already calculated to save some time. So this is the warning here. So if you don't want that, you need to delete the cache. Um, OK, and now I'm using the ERT show function. So not PG show, but ERT show. And um, this will display an electrical pseudo section. And um, just so that we are on the same page. So in electrical pseudo section, we also uh, demonstrated this here in um, 
this little video. I never thought I would be showing a YouTube video in a YouTube video, but life is full of surprises. Um, so you see the measurement schedule to the left, you see the sensitivities, and on the right-hand side, you see the pseudo section um, developing. So the pseudo section is just a color-coded data table uh, displaying the apparent resistivity, which the subsurface, so the apparent resistivity would be the resistivity that the subsurface would have for this measurement if the subsurface would be homogeneous. And for Venner and dipole-dipole measurements, these look uh, nicely triangular shaped. Here, this uh, data set was a multi-gradient measurement, so it um, looks a bit different. And we're not displaying the data here, but as the values, so you can display, um, define values that you want to display in a pseudo section, you could display the numerical factors. And here we are displaying the ratio of the numerical and the analytical geometric factor, which is essentially the topography effect. Another thing that we need in before we proceed with an ERT inversion is the um, eta error. And this is usually done in, in ERT with reciprocal analysis um, and fitting a linear model to, to the error. So um, this is done in the estimate error function in the ERT module. And it takes the data again, and we can specify the data in absolute terms. So here in a voltage, 50 microvolts, and also a relative noise floor with 3%. And I'm also adding the numerical, more accurate geometrical factors to the data container. So again, this behaves a bit like a pandas data frame. So I can use this uh, new, create this new column K for the geometric factors and put my numerical K factors in it. And then I will show the data again, but not the geometric factors now, but the errors also within such a pseudo section. So these are percentage errors now. And you also see that there are some higher errors uh, above 10% um, in the lower part here of this pseudo section. So the ERT data container also comes with a um, um, method to filter. So you have ERT. Um, filter. Oh, you know, you have ERT remove. Uh, no, not ERT, sorry. I'm calling the module. I want to remove from the data. So I should call the methods on the data. Sorry. Um, so I want to remove from the data. And um, this can be done for filtering. Um, to remove geometric factors or errors or a, a negative apparent resistivities. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, I will not do this here. I will continue with the inversion. Um, let's have a look at the data again. And now we want to invert it. And to invert it, we need to initiate the manager, call this MGR for the manager again. and this is the ERT manager, which I initiate with the data object. And this, again, comes with many um, different methods, uh, similar methods that you used before. So Thomas used the invert method to um, invert the travel time data set. And we can use the same method now in a different manager to invert the ERT data set. And um, so the call would be MGR invert again, and we can specify very similar inversion settings. So we can specify the regularization strength. Um, we could specify a Z weight, so promote uh, structure layering. So we have uh, less uh, smoothness regularization in the vertical direction um, with this Z weight factor. And um, this can take a while. So I pre-computed it. Um, and you can show the result with the show result method of the manager. You can specify color bar limits, access labels. So there are some settings and you see a very nice inversion result um, with the water table here. So resistive sediments on top of um, water saturated sediments. And we also see the uh, kind of a salt water wedge intruding into the coastal region. 
Um, so how well does this model, which we have here, it's just the first inversion result. It looks good, but how can we appraise its quality? And one thing we can do, we can look at the fit, similar as Thomas showed before. Uh, he had um, plots of apparent velocity, and we are plotting um, apparent resistivities here now. So measured data versus model response. We have a chi-square of almost two um, relative error of 5.7%. So this looks quite good, um, but we want to elaborate it a bit more. So we can have a look again at the misfit, similar as Thomas did it. So we want to be sure that there are no systematic errors in our um, misfit. We want to have a model which um, equally well describes the, the data according to their uh, data error. So I'm calculating here the misfit, which is the logarithm of the model response divided by the measured apparent resistivities divided by the data error. So it's a weighted misfit. And I'm using, again, the PG show command, um, which will detect that it's a data container and it will forward to ERT show. And um, we see it's, yeah, it's random, so there are no systematic errors. Um, so looks quite good. Um, one important thing here is, um, ah, I shouldn't have done this. Um, Let me do it. Sorry for that. Um, OK, I will come back to that um, later. I have to interrupt it, sorry. Okay, sorry for that. Just a second. Yeah, the inversion takes some time now. I interrupted it. Um, and I will continue from here, hopefully. Yes. So different than from in the travel time inversion, we uh, do not only have the parameter domain where we want to estimate parameters, but we also have this bounding region. Um, so I should make this a bit deeper here so that you can, or even deeper, so that you can see it. So in the yellow region, which has the marker two, this is the parameter domain where we estimate parameters. and the region around it, so if I remove this um, axis limits, you can see the full extent. This is just an outer region, which is um, not populated with, where we don't estimate parameters, but we populate it with a prolongation of the parameters with inside the parameter domain. And then it's just used for repeated forward calculations to um, calculate a more accurate model response. Um, and now we want to um, modify this parameter domain a bit. So this create para mesh PLC creates a piecewise linear complex. With the data container, we can specify the parameter size. And what I did here is I added this line to the, um, to the mesh. Um, so this represents the water table. So if I have some borehole measurements, for example, and I have a good idea on where the water table is. And at the water table, I would expect a strong contrast in electrical properties. And to promote this strong contrast, so, so to allow the inversion um, to, um, to allow the inversion model to have such a sharp contrast, I can reduce or even completely uh, turn off the smoothing constraint across this predefined boundary. And this is what I will be doing here. We will be calling create mesh again with this modified geometry. We will display it, and you will see that this boundary is now part of the inversion mesh. 
And then we initiate the ERT manager again. Now it's a different type of inversion. It's a constraint inversion. So we give it another name. We call the invert method again with very similar um, arguments as before. And then we show the result in the end. And you see that this structural boundary, it's just a line that we added to the mesh. But since it received a marker which is larger than zero, it will be automatically picked up by the uh, create constraints method, which will uh, produce its moving matrix. And if it finds such structural boundaries, it will disable the moving constraints across these predefined boundaries. So this is a yeah, um, an advanced type of inversion, which is very similar, but just uh, very simple to uh, realize with these um, mesh PyGimli mesh tools. And we still see the intruding, intruding seaward. Okay, um, and I think that uh, this was it. So we have done the inversion, we have looked at the model response, and we showed how to incorporate um, constraints into a field data inversion. So, and with that, I will hand over to Thomas again. Yeah, welcome back to the last notebook. We're gonna present uh, very shortly. I'm not gonna type this uh, uh, from scratch, I will show the notebook because it's a bit more complicating, but uh, one thing I was really keen on is to show some integration aspects, uh, is to use how to use an inversion with a custom forward operator. Uh, in this notebook, we will show you how to use an own forward operator on uh, with PyGimli, uh, uh, with the example of synthetic model for a drone-based control source, electromagnetic memory. I'm not gonna explain this method, uh, but I can give you some links. Uh, we're gonna invert the synthetic uh, I'm going to invert the synthetic data with PyGimli. And for this, we are using a really great modeling tool from Dieter uh, to the word models, which is called MPyMod. The, the repository can be found at this uh, link here. And MPyMod provides electromagnetic modeling for, for 1D vertical transverse uh, media with, uh, with arbitrary transmitters and centers in 3D. Uh, and this can be easily installed by Conda, Conda install MPmod, or even easier. Uh, with PEP on the command line or in the or in the notebook itself. I already did it. If you just uh, if you want to try it, you just have to type this uh, this line and here we go. Okay. As usual, we import all the necessary functions. We import uh, NumPy. We import the the plotting library and and uh, additionally we are now importing MPyMod. Uh, and we're going to use one function. And we first define some settings for the MPyMod modeling that we use. We uh, assume we're having a dipole transmitter on the Earth's surface, uh, which is perpendicular to the 2D uh, uh, plane. So it's it's going into the Y direction uh, with a length of uh, Tx length, which is 400 meters in this case. So it goes from Tx length divided by two to minus Tx length divided by two, has a strength of one ampere and, every, and everything. And then we're gonna have receivers in the air, which are magnetic receivers. And uh, this means, they are at the X position, which is a range from 50 meters apart from the source to 500 meters apart from the source, the typical setting with 50 meter uh, spacing. And the Y dimension is zero, and, and we're gonna the vertical magnetic field, uh, which is the, the angles here. And this goes into the MPMOD call, and there's some, some additional stuff that needs to be uh, done uh, for the MPMOD call. We're using different frequencies that we allow, uh, they are between 10 hertz and five kilohertz and uh, for doing so we define a function which is doing the mpymod call. So mpymod is basically only called by the function mpymod.bipole and we give all those input dat data from above using this dictionary and then we are going to use the, uh, the resistivity in the subsurface. Uh, uh, we're going to use the depths uh, of our layers and at the frequencies and we're going to have a matrix show this result. I'm I already generated a data function to show because we're measuring real and imaginary part of the data. I'm not going into detail about this one. What I want to show you is how the data are looking like. So I'm generating a model which is uh, having uh, three layers. Uh, one layer is from zero to to 100 meter steps, and the second one is from 100 to 200 meter steps, and the resistivity is 100 meter. Uh, 100 ohm meter, then 10 ohm meter. So it's a good conductor that we want to detect in about 100 to 200 meter depths, and then 100 meter again. And we're going to 
call this forward routine, and we're going to see the result as a function of a of a x position in meters and and the frequency in hertz. So we see uh, some imaginary part uh, at a higher frequencies and and lower offsets, and this is going to tell you we have a shallow conductor. So we want to want to put this into PyGimli, and that's why we are creating a class which is doing the modeling. So we so we we are deriving a forward class from the PG modeling class. And everything we have to populate is an initialization function. And we're saying we want to use a 1D match, which is an OCAM inversion. And we are going to use the, the response where we call this previously defined forward uh, operator using MPyMod. And then we have this, this matrix, which is uh, really an imaginary part. And, and we're going to uh, put this into a long vector and stack together the real imaginary parts. And we also provide a function that is generating a starting model. Uh, which is in this case 100 meters uh, depth. Now I'm using the this data, the synthetic data, do the same. So I'm uh, making a long vector of it and 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 uh, paste real imaginary parts together. Then I'm adding some error. In this case, I'm using 1% relative error. So I'm also using a, a, a random uh, a random number like we did before. So the random uh, number of you. Uh, of a relative error, we multiply it with a relative error, which is 0 0.01, and add a, a 1 to it and multiply it with the data. So every datum point will be uh, contaminated with 1% uh, noise. Oh my God. Mm. I'm going to see it. Okay. And I'm going to define my subsurface model. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining a subsurface model out of 21 layers, going from zero to 300 meter depth. And I'm initializing my forward operator with a fixed depth. And I'm starting with a with some resistivity. And I just can do a forward response of a, of a resistivity. And I can print this response. And these are, of course, only numbers right now. We, we won't have a look at this number. But what we know we're going to do is to use this forward operator in inversion. It's as simple as that. We are initializing uh, uh, a PyGimli inversion. We're setting the forward operator. You could also pass it directly here. Then what we're doing is, a, is to set up a, a model transformation, which is a logarithmic transformation. So we want to have all our resistivities in the subsurface to be positive. And moreover, they should be uh, above 1 ohmmeter just to, uh, just to get rid of uh, any problems, and we set this model transformation, and we run the model. It's as simple as that. So we specify in the inversion run, we specify the data, which is the, the, the data vector, then the error vector, which is being used for the error uh, uh, weighting, and we're going to specify starting model of 100 ohm meters, and, and we're going to have a look at the, at the data. The chi square is quite large at the beginning, uh, and it's Barely decreasing, but we will hopefully see that uh, it will find some uh, local minimum. Oh my God. Hmm. Let me see. So, it's, uh, so the inversion is very slow, but still uh, steady. Depends a bit. Now we have a drastical decrease of uh, uh, subsurface sensitivity. Now we are we are jumping towards chi square one. But this is actually what we want to do uh, is to reach chi square one. It's not always so uh, so straight monotonous down. But finally, we end up in a model that is having chi square one. So we don't have to 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 care about uh, 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 regularization strength. And the only thing that we want to do is to plot our subsurface model. As a depth profile, so we're going to plot the, the model resistivity over the depth. So starting at at over 100 ohm meters, as we did, and then at at a certain depth, which is here like 60, 70 meters, the resistivity is decreasing and reaching the the value of 10 that we specified. And actually, the synthetic model is looking uh, is uh, well, is looking very similar, and, uh, but we of course uh, end up with a smooth version of the synthetic model. OK, with this, I'd like to conclude and to have some uh, concluding remarks by Florian. OK, um, 
So this is where we will stop now, but this is not where you will have to stop. So there's a lot to explore on pygimli.org. We have a lot of uh, tutorials um, on, on the basics, on mesh interpolation, on the structure of the mesh. Could also be interesting for uh, if you come from a different package and you want to understand the mesh structure on modeling and then also on inversion. What Thomas just showed, how can I bring my own forward operator? How can I do an inversion with it? How can I use more advanced uh, regularization? And many different examples also for the various geophysical problems. Um, so make sure to check it out. If you click on an example, um, you will always have the possibility to download it both as a Python script and as a Jupyter notebook. Um, we also very much welcome contributions. So we hope that this tutorial also inspires new users, but also new contributors. And we have a contribution guide here. So uh, you can start by sending us your example, by improving the documentation. If you find something that is misleading, um, you can also click this improve, this page button to the in the right sidebar, which will directly bring you to GitHub where you can edit the respective page. Um, you can send us the examples you use. We could uh, put them here in the uh, sections. And if you're more advanced, you could also contribute to the code, which is now made easier because we put the uh, C++ part in a separate Conda package. So you can really contribute in the pure Python part um, over GitHub. And um, yeah, so make sure to check this website. There's also um, a list of publications. So if you're interested in who used uh, PyGimli so far, let's say for monitoring applications, you can um, search for different publications and you have everything within this database. Um, okay. And with that, I'd like to um, conclude. So we are very happy. We're looking very much forward to your contribution. We will be available today for the rest of the day in the uh, Slack channel. So make sure to um, post your questions there. And if you're watching this later, you can also contact us at mail.pygimli.org. And yeah, we also hope that we will be able to have such a gathering in presence um, some at some point in the near future. So thank you very much for watching this.